What's up guys, welcome to Vintage Genetics where it is all about classic bodybuilding and today it's time for a long awaited Q&A. A lot of people always ask me questions on Instagram, mostly also on YouTube. So every once in a while on my page at Wesley Visserers on Instagram, I ask you to ask me questions for a Q&A video here on the channel on YouTube. So I did that and uh, like hundreds of questions came in. So I just picked out a few that I uh, thought would be beneficial for multiple people. And uh, I'm going to answer them right now. So let's get started. Question number one by Golden Era Josh. Always train to failure, yes or no? In my opinion, um, you should go to failure on most of the compound exercises. Um, there's also a lot of people who don't understand how many sets they should do before hitting failure. So in my opinion, the set that you hit failure with should be your maximum weight, but that weight should be much higher than all the sets you did previously. So uh, it takes a while for you to know what weight you can do like eight or 10 reps with that you actually fail on that eighth or 10th rep. And next time you try to hit that same uh, rep repetition range with a slightly higher weight and that's progressive overload. However, you don't want to tire yourself out before hitting that final set of failure. So for example, on the bench press, and this will be the best way to do it for most people. Personally, I like to train a little more, more high volume, but for most people, it would be a few warm up sets with a lighter weight, hitting around 15 reps on each of those sets then one slightly heavier set of 10 reps that is a little more challenging, but then when you hit your failure set with a weight that you locked the previous time, so you know how many times you can rep 10 reps with, for example, you know that weight, and this time you try to hit that weight again and go to fear with a failure with a slightly heavier weight. So in my opinion, go to failure on every big compound movement at the last set, but some people think if I if I work if I um, write down a workout plan for someone and it says four sets of ten on the bench press, they think they have to do four sets to failure every single time. So they actually pick a weight and set number one, and then they hit the same weight every single set and try to go to failure every single time. Obviously, that is not the way. You want to hit one set choose the heaviest set, go to fear with that one, and then next time try to beat that one set. All the other sets don't really matter because that is the true working set of that exercise. Now you also have some isolation movements. Uh, in my opinion, you can go to fear on those as well as at the last set, but uh, if you really wanna get stronger, if you want a bigger chest, bigger legs, bigger back, then hit the true compound movements at the last set to failure. And by the way, guys, this is a more extensive Q&A as I haven't done a Q&A video for a while. So of course, this one will be a bit longer than usual. So I hope you don't mind that. Next question, not the fake Nick. And some names I cannot pronounce entirely because Instagram doesn't show the full name always. How can I bring up my back? No matter what I do, I can't progress in any of my exercises. This kind of, you know, I put these two questions together because it kind of correlates to the question before. Uh, if you cannot progress in any of your exercises, first of all, make sure you sleep enough, eight to nine to even 10 hours a night, good rest, have enough rest days and enough time in between each back workout. Uh, eat enough, of course, you have to be in a caloric surplus to actually be able to make a uh, progressive overload happen in the gym, to be sure of it at least. And um, then when everything, when that is all perfect, then you have to see what your workload is actually in the gym. So if you hit seven exercises for the back and five sets each, the volume will be way too high. So you have to choose, do I wanna work on the back width or the back thickness? In my case, for example, it really is the back thickness. So what I like to do is I start out with an exercise that can really hit that back thickness part. And for me, that is, for example, a wide grip pull up, allow me to really contract those upper rhomboids, those upper traps, really contract them hard. And I go to fear on that one. And every single time I try to increase the weight and the amount of, you know, um, uh, workload I can do on that exercise. 
Now, if you want to try to do it on each and every set, go to failure on every set, go to failure on every exercise, it's going to be very hard to progress with that because recovery will be an issue. So um, really stick to the basics of a back workout. So really stick to one or two pull down exercises, one or two rowing exercises, for example, to finish off with a deadlift or a rack pull and go to the max on the most important one, which you put in the front of your workout. And then the rest is going to be hard to progress because those are always going to be after already having fatigued your back. So those are really to fill up the back, get a good pump and really uh, finish off the workout to get enough volume in. But the first First one or two exercises, that's when you gotta really lock down the weight that you actually uh, use and then try to beat that weight the next time. Right, next question by Shariza Majamil. Can I build muscle while burning fat? And in my opinion, that is definitely possible, but you have to take a good look at your caloric intake and your weight and your progress in the gym. So. Only in this example that I'm going to give would it be possible to grow while losing fat. But your weight will remain stable. That is the first thing of this example. So when you're working out and you're in a caloric surplus, but you are actually um, you know, working out and your workout is increasing, you're getting stronger in the gym every single time, and your weight is staying stable, in the mirror what you will probably see is that you will gain more fullness in your physique and start to get a more conditioned look. So if you only go by the scale, which is a mistake a lot of people make, you might not even be losing any weight at all, despite looking better in the mirror. And when your goal is losing weight, uh, you know, uh, in general, that's a wrong way to look at it. In bodybuilding, uh, whether it's losing weight or gaining weight, you have to think of it like, okay, gaining muscle and losing fat. So the weight component is only secondary to that. Especially in a contest prep, a lot of uh, bodybuilders look at the skill as, uh, as a way of seeing whether they are progressing. And that is a mistake in my opinion. When I look in the mirror right now, I weigh around three kilos more than I actually did um, you know, when I was on stage. Um, now, as when I was two weeks out, I weigh three uh, kilos more right now, but those three kilos, they really went all into my muscle because the conditioning is almost the same, a little bit less, of course, some water retention underneath the skin, always after a competition. But I noticed that I'm growing into this weight right now. And this is a term you have to remember, growing into your weight means that your weight actually stays stable, but you're gaining muscle and losing fat. So that is possible. Of course, you're not breaking any laws of nature. It's simple. Um, even if you're in a caloric surplus or a caloric deficit, it is possible to remain in a stable weight, but still make the changes that you want to see, as long as the changes in your physique um, in your diet, in your training are small and in small increments. If your weight changes too quickly, whether it's going up or down, it's never a good sign. If it's going up too quickly, you will gain fat. If it's going down too quickly, you will lose muscle. That is not what you want. So sometimes for two or three weeks, your weight stays the same, but your, uh, you know, your body composition is changing. You look better and better. And that is what you want when you are really serious about bodybuilding, and especially when you're an advanced lifter. It's not all about the skill, it's about how you look. Next question by Ol Beke. If cardio is after your workout, when is the best time for your post-workout shake? So in my opinion, what you should do is first have a good pre-workout meal, then about one and a half hours to two hours, depending on how big the pre-workout meal is, you have a good workout. And uh, then if you cannot do cardio facet, which is in my opinion, the best way to do it, if you have to do it post-workout, then simply do cardio right after the workout and then have your post-workout shake. You really want your stomach to be primed, full of blood, to really take up all those nutrients. 
because if you do a workout, all the blood is your muscles. When you're doing cardio, the blood is still going to your muscular system instead of your organ system, which is, you know, responsible for digesting food. So if you, for example, have a workout, a heavy workout, and then you have a weight isolate shake, and right away you do your cardio, it's not going to be absorbed optimally or fast, and it might even be in the way of your cardio session. So have your post-workout shake after the cardio, and uh, then you will be just fine. You won't burn muscle if you simply do steady state cardio. Don't worry about that. Next question by Tham41296. Do you do any injury prevention? And uh, I actually do, uh, not uh, very much, um, you know, not actively, but I think about it a lot. Of course, within the workout itself, I always warm up. So most people wonder how I warm up every single time. For example, in the bench press, I like to do a couple of lighter sets with 15 to 20 reps to warm up the chest because I know if I go to my maximum weight within three sets, it's simply going to be tearing down on my shoulder joints, shoulder tendons, my chest. That's too much of a risk. So on those big exercises like the squat, the bench press, I like to do uh, quite a lot of sets beforehand. Uh, with a lighter weight to really warm up, get blood in the area, and that's a good way to prevent injuries. But also, if you want to prevent your uh, lower back from getting an injury, wearing a belt during very heavy uh, exercises like the squat or a deadlift or a rec pull is a smart thing to do in combination with, um, you know, really targeting your core muscles as well. So really brace yourself before doing an exercise. So you really have to think about protecting your muscles and joints and tendons before even doing an exercise. And then after the workout, I like to take my protein whey isolate shake by becomegladiator.com, pure whey isolate, alongside with hydrolyzed collagen. Hydrolyzed collagen will actually make sure that your tendon and joint raw materials is getting brought into those areas areas and especially when you're already warmed up the blood is in there you got a good pump then it's much easier for those raw materials to get into those areas so if my i had a injury well not an injury just a nagging pain in my right shoulder a good while ago but because i'm taking hydrolyzed collagen every single day my body is able to repair this quicker than if i wouldn't because you have to give it the raw materials and collagen isn't a super complete protein because there's an amino acid lacking that you need so that's why i combine it with a whey isolate so it's a complete source of protein you don't want to have your post-workout shake be pure collagen because that won't do the job for muscle building which is ultimately what we want and then i also have an inversion table basically if this is my body, you basically inverse yourself and then here's my legs, here's my head and it stretches out the lower back, those muscles to really relax it to prevent that tightness from occurring and it really makes everything go a lot smoother when doing any leg or back workouts. So that's basically what I do and of course I always do uh, cardio in the morning really to, you know, it's much more about being healthy overall compared to really doing specific things for something when it's already too late. That's my advice. Next question by Big Nuts Fitness. Goal placing for the 2020 Mr. Olympia. I have to say I am extremely happy and relieved that I'm uh, qualified for the 2020 Mr. Olympia, which means that right now I'm in a lean bulk, slowly gaining weight to really gain quality muscle exactly where I want it to be to compete with those top guys at the Olympia. So my goal right now is to be in that first call out, to be compared with the top guys. That right now is my goal and how I will stack up within that top five or six, I don't know, but that of course is my goal to be in that top call out. I'll do then my very best to compete with them, to battle it out with them and to show my best shape ever, which will be exponentially better than you saw at the Romania Pro. Uh, you have to remember from March to November, that's a time I had to uh, improve my physique for the Romania Pro. So that's quite a big difference that I made uh, in the legs, in the sweep of the legs, the hamstrings, the conditioning. But that's nothing compared to having a full time of a lean and proper bulk, getting much stronger, adding more muscle mass at the right places on top of already the improvements I've made since the uh, 
the Arnold Classic and the Olympia. So it's going to be an amazing battle, I'm sure. But my goal right now is to really be in that top callout. So the first callout is my Mr. Olympia goal. Next question by 1987 Anthony. Cardio on a lean bulk to be able to eat more versus no cardio and less food. What is your opinion? I always stick to my cardio in the off season. Of course, um, when I was doing the Romania Pro Prep, I did an hour of cardio every single morning fasted. You don't have to do it that long. What I like to do is in between 20 and 30 minutes, depending on what I will train that day, I stick to 20 minutes on a leg day because nowadays I like to have my breakfast, wait two hours and then have my workout. If I do too much cardio before my leg workout because the workout is close to that cardio session, it might take away something from the session even though it's just light cardio. But still in my head, the leg workout is so much more demanding energy-wise that I don't want to waste any glycogen at all. But for me, the cardio isn't so much about um, being able to eat more food because of the uh, calories you burn. It's more about the digestive uh, properties of moving before having your breakfast. So if you move your body, if you actually move around, and drink water beforehand. I always drink a liter of water the moment I wake up. It kind of wakes up your rhythm of the body. So usually when I wake up, I have a liter of water, then I do 20 to 30 minutes of cardio, either walking outside or on the stationary bike that I have at home. And after that, I always have to go to the bathroom because it wakes up my system, my rhythm to start the day off right. And the entire system starts up including the digestive system so i am you know it's my opinion that when you move around more you're able to digest your food better your intestines will work more efficiently you will get rid of all the waste and you'll feel a lot better the less toxins and waste are in your body the better your digestion will be and the better you're able to eat all that food and the better your appetite will be as well so the better your liver works the less toxins in your body the more appetite you will have in the off season and the easier it will be to actually eat your food. So for people who struggle to eat enough food uh, during the off season, they might think I'm not gonna do the cardio because then I'm even burning even more calories. But in fact, it might allow you to eat much bigger meals because your digestion will be improved. So try that out. It really has helped me a lot. I'm eating close to 5,000 calories now, no problem, I can eat literally a lot more if I want it, but I'm slowly going to amp it up. And uh, I will of course make full days of eating videos about that as well. But in my opinion, doing cardio in the off season, a little less of course than a contest prep will be beneficial for your digestion and ultimately the progress you make in the off season. Next question by Matteo Wald. I'm 23, natty, I eat in a caloric surplus. Can I train body parts twice a week? And uh, yes, you definitely should, whether you're in a caloric surplus or not, whether you're natty or not, training twice a week, every single body part is a very smart thing to do. When you, for example, train the back on a Monday, you want to train the back again somewhere within that week. It won't take an entire week to, you know, to recover from that back workout, maybe, uh, you, of course, take Tuesday off, Wednesday off, but Thursday, your back is pretty much entirely recovered from that workout. Almost no matter what you did on that Monday, unless you're, you know, really under eating by a whole lot and not sleeping enough. But those are different problems. This is a case of uh, sleeping enough, eating well, and uh, recovering well from those workouts because you are eating enough and sleeping enough, resting enough, taking the good supplements. You will be able to train everything twice a week very, very easily. And you actually must, because the moment you train your back on a Monday, that will increase the muscle protein synthesis of that muscle. And the more often in a year you can increase that muscle protein synthesis, which means muscle growth, the bigger your back will be at the end of the year. If you only train it once a week, that's 52 times it will be increased. Training it twice a week will be 104 times a year that it will be increased, it's literally twice as much. So training everything twice a week is a very smart thing to do. Next question by Brian Fatu. How to recover from tendon pain? Should you rest or keep lifting? I used to have tendon pain in my bicep, like the 
the bicep work connects to the forearm right here. What I did is I kept lifting, but very light, and I prevented doing any exercise that hurt. Your body is very good at telling you, uh, giving you signs when something is going wrong, and pain is one of the most obvious ones. When you feel pain doing an exercise, don't do it. Then you find an exercise that doesn't hurt. So when I did hammer curls with 12 kilograms, it did hurt. When I did them with six kilograms, it didn't hurt. So I increased the reps on six kilograms to be able to pump blood into that muscle. And I just told you guys in a previous question about the hydrolyzed collagen. Instead of taking it post-workout, I took it pre-workout. Why? If I take it 30 minutes before working out, the raw material is in my blood, in my circulatory system. And when I then pump up this muscle, it will all go in that tendon where it normally won't easily go because the blood supply to tendons and joints is poor if you don't do anything. But when you're working out, it is optimal. So when you then have the raw materials in your blood, pumping that in that area, it will be able to repair itself much more efficiently. So you definitely should keep lifting. Uh, lift as light as you can where you don't feel any pain. Also try to focus on more the eccentric motion where you are a lot stronger and where it probably will hurt a lot less because usually it hurts the most when you either stretch all the way or contract all the way. So going slowly downwards and don't stretch out all the way and then use your other hand to help it upwards again is a very good way to prevent uh, the pain from coming and to actually get blood in the area uh, actually using a decent weight. So no matter what the muscle is, that in my opinion is the way to do it. Pawan Parvesh, have you ever done 30 minutes cardio with an empty stomach in the morning? I actually just uh, told you guys to do an hour of cardio in the morning, fasted with nothing in the stomach uh, pre-contest, and right now 20 to 30 minutes uh, without eating anything, no BCAAs, no protein, nothing. Just water and the cardio. So many people are afraid of losing muscle because of doing cardio. As long as you don't feel anything burning, as long as you don't you know, get an enormous pump from doing it, nothing will happen. If you do slow cardio, take deep breaths, you have enough oxygen to burn that fat, you'll be fine. Then the substrate, which means the energy source you use for the movement, won't be carbohydrates, it won't be protein converted to carbohydrates, it will be fat, because your body is able to mobilize fatty, um, fatty acids into energy by actually go doing it slowly by letting enough oxygen get to those um, you know fatty acids so that in my opinion is the best way to do that cardio slow no high intensity cardio as long as you're not as you're, as you're fastest don't do high intensity cardio in my opinion next question by Ui Vin Duiri is the curly hair natural yes it is Next question by Josan Santo Sivora. What muscles to focus on for a classic physique? In my opinion, and it's been like that for years, the upper body needs to be big, massive, and full, especially the chest, the arms, the side delts, the back, to really create that V taper, then going down to the legs. However, nowadays, you do need a leg sweep as well. So instead of the Y frame, it now is more of an X frame. So, but the top of the X is of course more pronounced than the bottom. So in my ultimate classic physique is going to be a very wide V taper. So a big chest, big shoulders, big uh, back, good arms. You have to have good arms for a good classic physique. Going down into a small waist and then going outwards again to create that X shape for a classic physique. Of course, a modern classic physique. Back in the days, in the golden era, it was more of a Y shape, but right now I'm going for that modern classic physique look inspired by the golden era. So a combination of both, which is needed to be at the top of the game right now. All right, two questions in one. Why Danny and Big Fit Papa both ask more information about your personal workout plan and how often you train and what sort of split. Do you train people programming and nutrition? So first of all, to answer that first part, 
Yes, I do train people, mostly online coaching, making online nutrition plans, online workout plans, fully tailored, fully customized to your needs. So if you go to vincentx.com to plans and coaching, to the button right there in the menu, then if you purchase one of the plans, I will send you an email with a list of questions. And depending on the answers you give to those questions, I will fully tailor the worker plan to your needs, to your goals, to your desires, to make sure you actually make the progress that is tailored to your physique and the goals that you have. So no standard plans with me at all. I literally make everything myself, which a lot of people uh, don't really expect from a professional bodybuilder anymore, or they get a standard plan that is not being looked at, just being sent right away. It takes me three to four days to really make a plan like that for you. And uh, I also do coaching, uh, where the difference between making the plans and doing the coaching is in both instances, I make a personalized workout and or nutrition plan for you. But with the coaching, we have weekly or bi-weekly check-ins where depending on the progress you make and your experiences with the plans, I actually change the plans up so you, make, so you keep making the most optimal progress. And that is coaching. Of course, you're then also... Uh, I'm also always available to answer any questions you may have. And, um, you know, that's basically what I like to do. So I do train people in both nutrition and training plans, really working on the weak points, making sure the nutrition is top notch to make the most out of your situation. My own workout plan is I'm having four different days right now. And uh, on each of those days, this is the following what I do. That's my workout split. So first I have the chest and triceps. And then I have actually the, the, the legs. So in the leg workout is always very intense, always starts with the hamstring. So chest and triceps, then legs. Then I have a tricep workout and a side delt workout. So pure triceps right from the get go, because that is a weak point. Once that weak point is resolved, I can turn a tricep workout into something else. But right now I really want to get those triceps on par with the biceps. And then the last workout is a back and bicep workout. And then I repeat and I go back to the chest and triceps, legs, and then a rest day, good triceps. So at least have one rest day a week, but those four days stay stable. Next question by Lando van Riet. Does eating lots of vegetables, one to two kilograms, have any negative consequences? Um, it kind of depends on what kind of vegetables they are. So you can eat a lot of high FODMAP vegetables, which, which means that your body... Uh, won't be able to digest them properly and actually causes a lot of gas, bloating, discomfort, then the negative consequence will be malabsorption, the discomfort I was talking about, and your workouts will suffer because if you want to squat heavy and feeling bloated, that's not a good combination. You want to be able to eliminate everything in your intestines uh, solidly, in the bathroom. You don't want that to be a mess. And it will turn into a mess if you eat things that you cannot absorb, if you cannot digest them properly. So if you're like me, you should stick to the lower FODMAP vegetables. So an example, if you eat 200 grams of broccoli with every single meal, your broccoli, a cauliflower, asparagus, stuff like that, you will probably get bloated. And most people probably uh, um, experience this already. So if you experience this, try to stick to only one meal uh, with the broccoli, but the rest will stay lower FODMAP. Examples of lower FODMAP vegetables are cucumber, zucchini, um, eggplant, uh, bell peppers, carrots, stuff like that. You'll still have a very wide selection of vegetables to choose from and also spinach, any leafy greens that you can actually choose with your meals. And then eating one to two kilograms won't really impact anything unless you're very high uh, in a surplus where it's in, uh, important to keep the volume down per meal to be able to actually eat every, every two hours because if the volume is way too big, you simply won't have the appetite to eat that much. So when I'm in contest prep, I have at least, you know, two to 300 grams of low fat mat vegetables with every single meal in the form of leaf vegetables, a little bit of celery, you know, um, a very my, a little bit of asparagus, but mostly leafy greens, spinach, uh, kale, 
uh, lettuce, stuff like that, and ginger as well to give it a little more spice and to reduce the bloating as well if I get any. But uh, that's what I like to do pre-contest. But when I'm bulking right now, it reduces to 100 grams to even 75 grams a meal, still giving me around 500 grams of pure vegetables a day, so which is still very healthy, but taking up too much volume in your meals won't be good when you're doing a serious bulk and want to get all those calories in. So if you stick to low fat vegetables within a diet and you're able to eat all your meals, definitely go for it. If you only stick to high FODMAP vegetables, it might cause bloating and it might prevent you from eating properly. It might prevent you from having optimal workouts and simply you will be discomfort, um, you know, experience discomfort throughout the day, which is not a good thing. So if you notice that, try to switch up those vegetables and see what changes. Next question by Jacob Gruel. How do you think about cheat meals? Cheat meals? Um, in my opinion, you can have them if you stick to the diet for the rest of the week. That's what I do myself. Uh, pretty much every week almost, well, once every two weeks, I go out for dinner. When I go out for dinner, I go out for dinner. I, I, don't, look, I don't look at anything. I don't look at the menu, what I like, and until I'm full, I'm satisfied. I'm able to do this because I stick to the diet for the rest of the week. If you gain a lot of weight following the diet already and then have a cheat meal on top of that, it won't really go to the muscles, it will go to the fat stores. In my case, I feel great, I still am conditioned enough, I still am lean enough uh, to be able to uh, afford having a cheat meal every once in a while. I could have a cheat meal every single week, for example, after a leg day, having an extra 100 grams of carbs, for example, easily, and still maintain uh, this conditioning and simply build muscle. But for people who already follow an off-season plan, who already put a lot of carbs in every single meal, on top of that have an extra cheat meal, it might not go to the right places. You want the glycogen to go to the muscle stores and not the fat stores. So cheat meals do help if your diet is good overall, but if your diet already is a bit sloppy here and there, adding a cheat meal won't really do much justice. But of course, you know, when you're in the off season and going out to eat every now and then, if your goal is simply to gain weight, then of course you can do it. You don't have to worry about it that much. I mean, you have to be social. You have to have a life, of course, but when you are a top professional bodybuilder, Having those, you know, a lot of extra cheat meals might actually hinder your progress and might actually ultimately hinder what you look like on stage. So you want to keep that in mind. Kaboom. Next question by Max van de Water. Does caffeine have a negative influence on muscle growth? In my opinion, it does not. When I was uh, preparing for the Romania Pro, I had 200 milligrams capsules, tablets of caffeine every single time I did my cardio. Why? Because it simply has been proven to increase energy expenditure by a little bit, and little bits consistently will make a bigger part of the effect of the entire diet, of the cardio session. So that's why I like to use it. And uh, a lot of pre-workouts have caffeine as well. It might indirectly have a negative influence if you take caffeine close to bedtime and it actually prevents you from sleeping, from having a good sleep, from having a deep sleep. Because I said, having a restful sleep every single night and rest in general is important for muscle growth. If you don't have that, the muscles simply won't grow as much as they can. So indirectly, it might actually have a negative influence, but caffeine itself, in my opinion, does not. Next question by Gies Dahl. How often do you feel pain in your shoulders? Do you do the shoulder fix every single day? The reason I picked this question is I do have a shoulder fix video on my YouTube channel. So just uh, look up shoulder fix Wesley Vissers or shoulder fix Vinci Genetics and you will find it. it has quite a lot of views. A lot of people tell me on Instagram it really helped them. They really thank me because after years of having shoulder impingements in the front belts, after doing that shoulder fix, it actually fixed it for them, which is why it's called the shoulder fix, which is amazing. Um, but I haven't used it in quite a while because I used to do it a lot. Now it's gone and now I know exactly what causes it. It's a wrong form of doing a bench press. So if you do a bench press, you want to really keep your uh, elbows tucked in and then do the bench press really using the chest. If you do it like this, 
you will round your shoulders and that will actually make sure that your shoulders actually get hurt and um, working the front delts on top of doing a lot of chest workouts means that the front delt will actually be overdeveloped compared to the real delt pulling harder on the shoulder joint which would actually be bad for shoulder health and that will actually cause injuries as well so you really want to work the rear delts so a lot of you know if you look at like this in the mirror you want the rear delt to be just as big to be sticking backwards as much as the front delt is sticking forwards if that is not the case you have to work the rear delts more and uh, i like to do that by doing it on every single back day doing face pulls uh, reverse flies for the rear delts and not uh, separately working the front delts in my case i know that a lot of people like to do military presses very heavily like to work the front delts or like to work the shoulders but when, when i work the shoulders i always start with the side delts and the rear delts and end with the front delts if i even do a front delt exercise because whenever i do chest the front delts are impossible to eliminate from the movement and i already grow simply from doing the chest workout so i don't have shoulder pains now and if you really do have shoulder pains, even after stretching, a good tip is simply skip every single movement that causes the pain. Because, to be honest, before I did the Romania Pro contest, I did have some shoulder uh, pains that didn't go away because I was in such a low deficit caloric-wise. But I took, I had to take uh, at least um, close to two weeks of rest from doing any heavy exercise for the shoulders and a few days of complete rest from of course training because of the competition and it went away and now it's still gone and now my calories are going up recovery is going up and it's still absolutely gone so taking rest is even the biggest factor in your pain not going away so everything i said will definitely help you in getting rid of that shoulder pain next question by hayden costello how do you feel about the Game Changers film? Do you believe a vegan diet is the best? Um, of course, you guys might get tired of hearing this debate about the Game Changers. And honestly, I still haven't seen it. A lot of people around me have seen it. I have um, gotten a lot of emails that they want their diet changed to a plant-based diet. And it's understandable because I did see some clips of Game Changers and it's very well set up, really well, very well thought out. To how they want to present their case but uh, from what i've heard and i listen to a lot of podcasts which also answer similar questions like this so the game changers uh, documentary and i will won't be taking too long about this because uh, it's been answered quite a lot by other people the game changers documentary only shines light on the plant-based diet uh, being purely plant-based and what benefits it might have and then someone being purely uh, meat-based, you know, without taking into account that they might also be having enough vegetables. But they say, okay, if you eat only meat, that's very bad for you. If you eat only plants, it's very good for you. But the middle ground is where it's at, especially for people who want to build muscle. If you want to build muscle, you simply need high-quality protein sources. I haven't eaten meat myself for five years now, but I have been eating fish all the time so my uh, protein always hovers in between 350 and 400 grams a day and most of that is of course whey protein in the form of whey isolate which is a dairy source and also pure fish tuna whitefish codfish halibut uh, mackerel salmon and uh, even more a lot of different kinds of fish which provides me with a big source of animal protein and the thing about animal protein sources is the content that it is high in is leucine. In most plant sources, leucine, which is an amino acid, an essential amino acid, is lower. You need leucine because that is literally the trigger, the button that turns on muscle protein synthesis. And you need the amount of leucine to be above a certain boundary. If it's below the boundary, it won't turn on that button, it won't turn out turn the switch and muscle protein synthesis won't occur uh, at least not in a maximum way that you want it after a workout so that's why you have to have a combination between animal sources of protein combined with plenty of vegetables for the micronutrients you have to remember this vitamins and minerals are part of your metabolism also your protein metabolism in simple terms it means when you eat protein 
the moment you digest it, metabolism begins. And you, protein metabolism basically means that you turn the protein you eat into the protein your body can actually use and turn into different proteins to for different tasks. One of those tasks, of course, is to build muscle. So if you miss certain minerals and vitamins coming from those plant sources, you won't have an optimal working metabolism and you won't be able to build muscle optimally as well. And on top of that, your uh, and and an energy metabolism will also go down if you don't have enough, uh, uh, for example, iodine and uh, other minerals to actually aid the thyroid function. And there's so many more examples of this. And also uh, taking Himalayan salt, which of course is not an animal source, but uh, there's a lot of magnesium in there, iron in there, which you have to get from the plants. And iron, of course, also from animal sources, but most minerals and vitamins come from plant based foods which you need to aid the metabolism of the protein that you eat so it's a combination of both that works the best so not a pure plant-based diet not a pure meat-based diet but a combination of both will bring you most benefits of both worlds next question by jack c jack c have you hit the weight cap? And no, I haven't. If you watch uh, part one of my Romania Pro, yeah, part one, I think, either part one or part two, I uh, literally show the weight that I write down after I measure my height, then I uh, weigh myself with all my clothes on, including the vest, I still weighed below 247 pounds, which is my weight cap. So I think I still have around four to five pure muscle to go. Um, in the back of my mind, of course, I have to be very conditioned for me not to go over that weight cap if I put on five pounds of muscle. But I still have quite a lot of muscle to go, which I will, of course, put on all the weak points like the glutes, the hamstrings, the back thickness, and the triceps. So that's my goal. And uh, I'm going to really, really get close to that weight cap when I get to the Olympia. Next question by Polydoros Demetriadis. Are you going to see, are we going to see you train with a classic physique athlete? Do you have any tours planned around Europe? Well, I will actually be training with a recent classic physique winner in Europe very soon in this gym right here, 100% fit gym in the Netherlands in best. So yes, I will be training with a top classic physique competitor who will also be at the Olympia, a very humble guy. Uh, you will see it soon enough on the channel and I will actually be training with him within two weeks. So that's going to be awesome. But I will also be going to the United States of America somewhere in the spring of next year, at least in the beginning of the year somewhere, not too long into the year to also tour uh, some gyms there and hopefully train with some big names there as well. So a lot of things are coming to the channel. Thanks to you guys, we are able to do this. Next question by N. Sundstorm, Sundstrom. Personal question, how was school when you grew up? Love your content, Wes, thank you very much. And uh, how was school when I grew up? Um, basically high school, well, elementary school was pretty awesome, honestly. Made a lot of friends there. And back then, you didn't have to worry about the future at all. You just went to school. Uh, you didn't have any homework. You just listened to the teacher, did whatever what was asked of you. And it was very easy for me at the time. Um, had uh, every single day, basically had someone to hang out with at home. A lot of gaming, of course. I used to play on a PlayStation. A lot of kills, uh, no. Um, what was it called? Duke Nukem, time to kill, of course. A lot of games like that. Um, having good memories about that time. The high school comes around, of course, it's a bit more difficult, but still relatively easy compared to what I'm used to now. And of course, always looking back, I was like, oh, I should have studied a little bit more. The only class that was really simple was English, because uh, what you needed to do for English was, you know, in my opinion, very elementary-like, so was easy to pass those tests without even studying for it but math and um, math uh, chemistry and physics stuff like that you really did have to study for but that's what what you know I was interested in that as well so it wasn't a hassle to study for that uh, but then French and German um, languages like that of course it's fun to learn different languages but I was more of an English guy 
uh, than a German or a French guy. So, But overall, it was a fun time. Of course, when you're in the moment itself, you think, oh, I have to go to school. But when looking back, that time was pretty awesome, I have to say. Um, you know, not really a lot of um, chaos going on. Uh, quite a lot of people who I know went to school and had a lot of fiascos going on, a lot of teachers, um, you know, going home because the class was so chaotic, but that never happened to me. So I had a pretty peaceful time at school. And uh, yeah, that's basically how it went. Uh, only pretty good memories. Next question by Romanian Mass Monster. Hey Wes, how do you keep your skin so clear even with vitamin S and all that food? Um, I assume that most people don't have clear skin when using vitamin S and eating a lot of food. First of all, quality matters. So if you eat a lot of junk food, if you eat food that your liver is required to clean up, of course, if your liver doesn't have the capacity, because you're also using vitamin S, to clear out those toxins, part of the toxins will come out through your skin. Your skin is the biggest organ you have, and it will actually show you how healthy you are on the inside. So, of course, when your skin is clear, you know that the inside is going quite well as well. Then you actually know uh, without certainty, because you still have to do blood tests to test everything, but you know that your liver and at least the toxin toxin removers of your body are doing their job. Because if you do have a lot of uh, skin breaking out, that means some part of your hormones or an organ, something is not uh, in balance. Something is not working right. Something is, you know, some, something has to be fixed. So taking the right supplements, eating the right foods, uh, staying to the right vegetables. There's so many factors going on. And of course, personal hygiene is very important as well. But... Um, I don't do anything consciously to keep my skin clear. What I do is simply live a healthy lifestyle, uh, make sure I eat plenty of vegetables, make sure I don't cheat every single day. Uh, the fat sources I take are all healthy, like avocados, coconut oil, sesame oil, walnut oil, avocado oil, uh, almonds, whole natural peanut butter, stuff like that. So uh, also um, dark chocolate, um, the fat sources do kind of matter because the stuff actually coming out of your skin is mostly comprised of the fat, uh, the unhealthy fat. So if your body simply has trouble digesting those, getting rid of those, the toxins that are associated with those is going to cause problems in the skin as well. So it's a combination of your lifestyle, of your hy personal hygiene, and of course the quality of everything that you use. And some supplements like milk thistle to help your liver cleaning everything will help get your skin clear as well. But at the root of things, in my opinion, is the food that you eat. Next question by SRB Gorilla. I'd like to know your opinion about cooking oil. What do you prefer and why? Cooking oil, I actually just talked about it. I like cooking oils that have a high uh, cooking point. So if you use cheap olive oil and you put it in a pan, you see a lot of smoke coming from it. If you see that, then it's actually burning and actually changing the chemical structure and it might actually be toxic for the body. That's not what you want. So you want to use an oil that has a high burning point like avocado oil, like, um, let's see, coconut oil, macadamia nut oil. So that's the cooking oils I like to use, but sometimes I don't even like to use cooking oils in the pan. I like to use the oils after preparing the food. So I like to cook the fish sous vide style, which I will make a video about vacuum sealing everything. You don't need to use anything but the vacuum sealer and some herbs you put in there and then cooking it. But that's a video for another time. Then I simply cook the rice, prepare the vegetables, steam the vegetables, put it all in a container and then put the oil on top of it, like some sesame oil, which has a great flavor, great aromatic oil or walnut oil or the coconut oil for a post-workout, just a very delicious. And then you know that you actually have every single milliliter or gram of that oil because sometimes some is left in the pan and you don't get all the macros right so if you want to be sure add it to your food afterwards next question by ayush gandhi 2001 diet and water control in peak week uh, let me just tell you what i did i kept the diet uh, very low carb up until the loading days and i only had let's see um well, two true loading days. So the contest was on a Sunday and Friday was a, a bigger loading day. 
Saturday was a little lighter loading day, and the Sunday itself was only the three, first three meals were bigger meals, and um, then I made sure at least two hours before going on stage I didn't have any meals anymore to keep my stomach flat. So I only had two loading days, and comprised of carbohydrates I was already used to. So only oatmeal, rice, so actually rice flakes, rice and sweet potatoes and then adding some healthy fats and lowering the protein all the other days beforehand were simple low days with more voluminous meals like with the leafy green vegetables only using the low fodmap vegetables so the digestion won't actually change it will keep going and i didn't change any food items throughout my entire prep i kept it with food items that i'm actually used to eating and um, the water control I actually only, I drank a lot of water the week beforehand, eight to nine liters a day. I kept the sodium up as well, so keeping both of them up, up until the day beforehand, then I dropped the water entirely. I also dropped the sodium, and dropping them at the same time will allow your body to actually get rid of more water, and then you'll actually wake up a tad bit sharper than the day before, and then you only have very small sips of water with every meal to be able to absorb the carbohydrates in your muscle, and that's it. So a very simple approach, and uh, I might actually make a separate video about this if you guys are interested. So if you are, make sure to comment down below if you want a peak week video of how I approached my Romania Pro peak week. Next question by Instant Maxi. Do you take any other supplements uh, other than your protein powder? Uh, I do take other supplements, of course. Right now, I uh, always take the whey isolate protein by becomeglider.com. Make sure to check out the website, to check out my own formulated whey isolate. So it's really formulated by myself. Um, but next to the whey isolate, I like to take omega-3s and krill oil proven to improve the HDL cholesterol and it's good to lower the LDL cholesterol as well so good for those values I also take uh, a multivitamin I actually take a lower dose multivitamin which I can take multiple times a day so what I told you beforehand vitamins and minerals are important for overall metabolism so I like to combine a lower dose vitamin uh, pill with my meal so it actually can be absorbed properly if you take a vitamin pill fasted nothing of that will be absorbed the way it should be um, let's see what I also take. I also take actually digestive enzymes uh, to help with the bigger meals, especially the breakfast, which is the pre-workout meal mostly, and the post-workout meal. Uh, I take two capsules with those and one capsule of digestive enzyme with the other meals. And what's in there is like papain from papaya to help digest protein. Also a bromelain from uh, pineapple and also some carbohydrate and fat uh, digestive enzymes but uh, to me the protein of course is the most important uh, i should also take a vitamin d uh, separately which is a very highly formulated vitamin d supplement i take in the morning with my breakfast because you need it to be fat soluble because the vitamin d is a fat soluble vitamin i take it with my breakfast because that has around 15 to 20 grams of fat allowing it to be absorbed uh, what else do I take? I take some extra magnesium before going to bed to help with my sleep. 500 milligrams of magnesium by glycinate, I believe. Magnesium oxate or magnesium. Another form of magnesium doesn't absorb as properly. You have like 10 different forms. But the form I take does absorb quite easily. It helps you sleep, helps you relax as well. Helps relax the muscles. Um, I think that's about it. Um, yeah. Not too much, and sometimes on a rest day, actually, I take a high dose of vitamin C of 1,000 milligrams. Uh, why on a rest day? Because you don't want to take it around the workout. You want the uh, free radicals and the inflammation from the workout to be actually elevated to you get, so you can adapt for the next workout. If you take a vitamin C, it will actually remove some of that and won't allow yourself to adapt to it because it's already removed. You don't want that. And uh, I will also be coming out next to the Become Glider Way Isolate with a pre-workout formulated by myself, which will be also be available on the website. Also, the, the multivitamin I'm talking about, the omega-3 highly dose that I'm talking about. Also, of course, creatine, just a simple creatine monohydrate, which is the best form out there, which I also take, by the way, 5 grams a day. And um, some other... Um, uh, supplements as well. So make sure to check out becomeglider.com 
and check out my social media to see when it will be released. And the final question by Michael B. Fit. Will you be at the FIBO Germany in 2020? Yes, I will. I've been at the FIBO a lot of times now, and every time I go, I meet a lot of awesome people, so I definitely will keep going. So, uh, and there's a slight chance I will actually have my own booth there, but uh, regardless, I will be going there, and uh, you will see me there for sure, and I will announce it all over social media, so make sure to follow me at Instagram, at Wesley Vissers, and keep following this YouTube channel, Vintage Genetics. Anyway, guys, I really want to thank you for watching, and thank you for the incredible support. Without you guys, it would not be possible. I'm really enjoying life right now, and I'm going to focus entirely on the 2020 Mr. Olympia. I didn't answer the question about that yet, but to answer anyone who has a question, no shows in between, only the Olympia to improve uh, as much as I can for that show to stand next to the top competitors and compare myself to them. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to enjoy this time and we'll log everything, how I will be building that muscle that is still lacking from my physique to compare to them. So a lot more videos coming, like full days of eating, working on my weak points, all the supplements I'm taking, and a lot more. Anyway, guys, I want to thank you so much for watching and don't forget to stay golden.